My advice to those who wish to learn the art of scientific prophecy is not to rely on abstract reason, but to decipher the secret language of nature from nature's documents, the facts of experience. You see, this is the, <laughs> this is the guiding thing. When 1989, March of 1989, when the announcement came out, at that time I was head of the anti-submarine warfare department, and we had about 450 scientists and engineers, and included in that group were two electrochemists, uh, Stan Spock and Pam Boss, both PhDs, right. and, and they were working on high energy density batteries. Well, of course, Stan and Pam are both electrochemists, and also good experimentalists. Well, we were friends and we'd talk at meetings and uh, we'd talk about cold fusion and we, we weren't able to work together until other people in the Navy, the Office of Naval Research people, realized that we had some promising result. Uh, so being electrochemists, they knew a little bit about uh, chemistry and, and what reactions might be taking place. And also, they knew Flashman in advance, so right. they, they had some knowledge of what Fleischmann was doing. I was listening and I found that there's complete misunderstanding. There's, uh, the, 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 there's essentially a chaos in there. Whereas a lot of people set out at that time to try and replicate what, Fleisch, what they thought Fleischmann had done. Right. And there's a difference between what they thought and what he actually had done. So a lot of people impatiently started with a bulk palladium rod of some unknown origin and electrolyzed against it. And when they didn't see results in a matter of hours or a couple of days, mm. they thought, well, this is wrong. And they assumed Flashman had made a mistake rather than that they had made a mistake. Well, fortunately, Stan and Pam, being electrochemists, uh, went about it differently. You have to st define your initial conditions. You have to know what you are dealing with. And Stan came up with the idea of co-deposition, which actually was a brilliant stroke because in the process of depositing palladium onto the cathode, he was also evolving the deuterium there and loading it into the palladium lattice as it was building up. What is so interesting about it? There was a, people were saying, okay, here, it takes so long, several days or something, to charge. And then it takes weeks before the onset of reaction. What happened in the meantime? I knew that I could charge the, I could get the high DPD ratio very fast by simply co-depositing. In other words, by plating out in the presence of evolving things. You apply a small current in the beginning that is large enough to evolve deuterium from the D2O solution at the cathode. At the same time, the cathode reacts with platinum ions, and platinum ions pick up two electrons from the cathode, plate out as platinum metal. So you have two processes going, going on at the same time. That's why it's called coal, and you're depositing deuterium from the solution and platinum also from the solution onto a, a substrate, usually copper, and you form your, your own platinum already loaded with deuterium as you plate it out. This is a very well-known procedure. There's nothing new about it. But what does it do here? It eliminates the question, do we have full charge or do we not, and all that, all sorts of questions answered. Well, the main feature is that you make your own platinum by plating the platinum from a platinum salt out of solution so you have a high purity of platinum for one thing and you make it yourself. You don't have to buy it, you don't have to depend on the metallurgy of some other company. You just make it right there and so therefore it has a much better chance of being reproducible I think and, and that was the main attraction that could be a reproducible experiment. Several things resulted from that. First of all, reproducibility was very high. Second, you didn't have to wait two weeks. In fact, we could see evidence of 
the cathode heating up within a few minutes where it would be hotter than the solution. Next question is, that is easy to do. What is difficult that most people don't know how to do it and what do we do? They were having falling down nice black powder. A lot of them had problems though with getting excess heat because like just like I didn't know what the problems were, if, if their cell was too small they weren't plating out enough palladium and if their calorimetry was not accurate enough they would not see it anyway. The problem is that you have to start with very small current to deposit at least two or three monolayers of palladium. You see, in this, if the palladium is so thin, it will not take hydrogen or deuterium. Deuterium does not penetrate. If you have deposit, say, uh, you have gold, and then you deposit a little bit of palladium, the first three layers, the, uh, the hydrogen or deuterium will not absorb. And then that gives you the reason that you can build up and the thing will not be falling off. Okay, it was frustrating because I didn't understand some things at that time. And one thing, my cell was small, the solution was were the same concentration as theirs, but they had a much larger cell. So they were plating, off, plating a lot more platinum than I was. And I, I later figured out I was only plating 0 0.01 cubic centimeters of platinum. And typically, in my experiments, I'd get about one watt per cubic centimeter, and such a small amount of plating was being plated, the most I would likely see would be 10 milliwatts, and my calorimetry could only measure when it was above 20 milliwatts, so therefore I didn't see it, but I didn't understand that at the time. It was only when I got exceptionally high power density that what I see in effect. I saw, I think, two out of 34 experiments gave excess heat. When I calculated the power density, because the small amount of palladium deposited, the power density was, I forget exactly, but something like 60 watts per cubic centimeter, much higher than any normal experiment would have given, but it was enough that I could measure it on my calorimetry. After the program closed down, I got a chance to go to Japan, work at the new hydrogen energy laboratory. I took a new, some new ideas about co-deposition with me, and also I had a Fleischmann Pons Duracell, which is about this big and catch it in my little tiny test tube. So instead of 18 milliliters, I had 90 milliliters of solution. So when I plated it out, I had five times as much palladium on the surface, and that made a big difference. And I, I also had a much more sensitive calorimetry of the Fleischmann Pons Dura calorimetry that could measure within one milliwatt. And so when I got in Japan, I had a much more accurate calorimetry. I had a much larger amount of platinum that was plated, and I ran only had time because I only had six months. At the very end, I ran three experiments on cold deposition, and all three gave excess power, excess heat. Three out of three in Japan, using my new solution and better calorimetry and a much bigger cell, plating out much more platinum on the surface. So I think it is reproducible, but you have to get enough platinum that you get enough heat that you can measure it. A lot of other people had problems in their experiments and they weren't getting the reactions they thought they should get. And so they said, well, it doesn't work. And, and Stan and Pam were having success. If you use it correctly, you will have 100% reproducibility. My position or my approach is use everything as simple as you can. Don't complicate things. So now the problem was, okay, we need to find out, uh, is it really producing heat? Well, you can start with calorimetry and do this thing, or you can take a very simple thing. You can take a glass tube, bend it, uh, take a little piece of copper, attach, uh, uh, attach a thermocouple to it, and paste it on... Uh, you know, uh, and so fasten it to the glass tubing and plating on one side and measure the temperature on the back side so you will know how, what is the temperature on the thing and measure the temperature in the solution and you will see. And sure enough, we see immediately heat, excess heat production. You look at the amount of excess heat produced and I've heard Martin say this, you know, if you converted every 
atom in the cell to energy at three or five electron volts per atom, mm -hmm. there aren't enough atoms there to account for the amount of heat that's been produced. Right. So that that's how they arrive at the uh, conclusion that it must be a nuclear event. So you measure the temperature on the back side of the cathode where the platinum is deposited and it was hotter than the solution which is unusual and shows that there's something some heat production going on at the cathode. And that was counterintuitive because there's more resistance in the solution than there is in the copper cathode. So the solution should be heating up faster than the cathode and that wasn't the case. So so that clearly indicated to us that the source of the heat was in the cathode. So he didn't tell you how much exactly, but I was developing accurate calorimetry that I could measure the excess heat, also, well mainly the excess, called it excess power, but power times times is energy, and so we'd measure the excess power by, by the calorimetry. The question was, well, what would we do if we put that uh, light water, normal light water, and put, uh, prepare the codeposition light water, and put them in the magnetic field, and electrolyze. Well, we did it first day, nothing happened, just second day, nothing happened. The third day, we see rising, rising the temperature of the solution. We have a thermocouple in the solution, underneath of this one. And then, bends, and within a minute, boils off, explodes. Runaways, anyone who's worked in this field for any length of time has probably had a couple thermal runaways. They've probably spent months trying to reproduce it right. and, yeah. and can't. Uh, if you calculate, you have to conclude that's a tremendous amount of extra heat. You know, when we first started this in, in 89, you know, we had some experiments, one experiment we were doing, where I think we were sampling it once every 30 seconds or once every minute. Right. And, and we came in one morning and the cell was dry and, you know, something had happened. The, right. the, the electrode had disappeared. We, when we looked at the data, everything was fine. In the last 30 seconds, you know, we didn't see any huge rise or anything. Mm -hmm. And then the next 30 seconds, it was, it was gone. So we missed what happened. Mm -hmm. Probably the best uh, reproduction of that that I'm aware of is some work that Stan did with Jack D, who's another scientist at, at the lab who did who was working this area, and, and this was the light water on, in palladium, and in three out of the ten cases, uh, they had a, a thermal runaway where the uh, cathode, literally, which was a palladium wire, platinum wire, it, it melted in two, fell down into the bottom of the of the acrylic cell, right. and and was hot enough that it it melted through and melted a hole. Right. And so the the solution, through a combination of of leaking out the hole and 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 heat, you know, vaporization, uh, disappeared, uh, and he had in three out of ten cases. So that's that's right. a pretty significant yeah. result. It's hard to to identify exactly what triggers it. Mm. it, it in all of the cases, it happened after about three or four days. They would. Right. Of electrolysis, and and they were doing uh, cycles. So maybe 300 milliamps per square centimeter for 90 seconds, mm -hmm. and then then complete reversal down mm -hmm. to five milliamps per square centimeter for five seconds, right. and then and then back up. And they they were doing that cycling when it happened. Well, there was a professor in the seminar at the University of. Uh, uh, here, UCSD, and there was another fellow, Evans, working for Atomic International. They were using a infrared camera to photograph the surface to look for the heat. They saw rather unusual uh, heat uh, pattern. Uh, so when I saw this pattern, I said, why don't we try to do that on a codeposited thing? Again, that's something that co-deposition allowed us to do that other protocols would not have allowed. In that case, we had a nickel mesh, and I believe it was a nickel mesh, a mylar window, a thin mylar window, and we co-deposited uh, palladium onto the, the nickel mesh, and we had the IR camera looking at the back side of it. 
And what do we see? Spots. Hot spots. When you look at this one. Now, what does it mean? It tells you that uh, the heat is not produced uniformly over the whole volume, but in certain spots. And the spots are short-lived. They went on to do many different things in co-deposition, not with x-rays, radiation, tritium, uh, acoustic studies, where they, they played it onto a microphone, and, and they could hear the sounds made by the fusion burst. They tested what magnetic fields do, what electric fields do, how that changes things, and did a lot of studies in that area. And uh, they probably published more referee in refereed publications than maybe any other group that I know of. I could not really judge the quality of their work, but I knew the quality of their character and their expertise. Mm -hmm. and, and so when they were producing these results, and then they published them, they wrote them up in papers, and submitted them for peer review, and they were getting published, that provided the shield that I needed to keep them to try and keep them fun, keep them going. You know, you could say, boy, that was a stroke of genius, and in it, because it, it allowed you to do the experiment quickly, um, there was a huge, significant flexibility. You know, we could co-deposit onto a cathode of about any shape. You know, we could, we could glue a thermocouple right to the back of it, so we, you know, in intimate contact, so we could, we could see exactly what what we were seeing. A completely new method of doing the the study, without depending on palladium from some method of manufacture, which could vary one manufacturer to another. They came up with their own method of making it right in solution by plating, which gives you pretty much the same quality palladium in every experiment. I think that that was a, that was a genius stroke coming up with that cold deposition idea. You know, co-deposition became the lab rat, you know, because it, it was so flexible and reliable. You know, they say, is it rather to be, better to be lucky or good? And, and I think in the case of Pam and Stan, they were both. Those were the two people. Without Stan and Pam, uh, we would not have been involved in it. It would have died. There would have been, you know, some of the other groups, some people that tried it and, and failed and, uh, it would have evaporated in the woodwork and and uh, it, it wouldn't have carried on. I went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, I talked to a, one professor there and my question was this, am I capable of doing any research? After all, I'm 10 years out of this thing. Well, it turned out that uh, yes, I was capable of <laughs> And after two years, I got my PhD there, and the end of the story. And then I started working and making trouble for people.